Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with CIS, uh, we are a public policy research organisation that is primarily committed to promoting the principles of classical liberalism across the economics, education and cultural spheres. Uh, for the past 15 years, Brendan O'Neill has been one of the world's leading critics of political correctness. He's the editor of Spiked Online, as Alan Jones said the other day. He says things that you're not meant to say. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Brendan O'Neill. What I just want to talk about for about 10 or 15 minutes is um, two things. Firstly, the problem with political correctness, as I understand it, and then the problem with some of the pushback against political correctness that is, curr that is currently taking place. So uh, on political correctness itself, one of the most frequent criticisms that is made of people who oppose political correctness is that we just want to turn the clock back. We want to go back in time to an era in which middle class, middle aged white men ran everything and minority groups and women knew their place. That's the criticism that's always made if you say I'm anti-PC, I don't like PC, I, I hate PC. I can't speak for all opponents of political correctness, but I can speak for myself, and in my case, the precise opposite is the case. For me, it's the exact opposite of that. My concern about political correctness, my opposition to political correctness, is not driven by some warped nostalgia for an older, whiter era, but by the precise opposite. It's precisely because I am committed to the idea of minority groups and women having a serious role to play in society and engaging in society on an equal footing with white men that I am opposed to political correctness. Because I think the most insidious achievement of political correctness has actually been to undermine some of the great social gains of the past 50 years or so, particularly the idea of racial equality and gender equality. And I think that's actually one of the things that PC has done most effectively. Um, PC actually does the opposite of what it claims. It doesn't expand the inclusion of all groups in public life and work life and everyday debate and cultural knowledge and all those other things we consider to be valuable. It actually limits that engagement. It stymies it. It makes it more difficult. So let me just give you a few examples of what I mean by that. I think one of the key things about political correctness and its policing of language and its policing of attitudes and its policing of how we think about the world has been its rehabilitation of racial thinking. So this is one of the strange things about the period we live in. All of a sudden, it has become fashionable again to think in a racial way. So you always see the ritual of racial announcement. People will always announce their race before they say something, as a white man or as a black woman. There's this kind of, you'll see this on campuses in particular, in particular you see it in certain trendy political circles, this ritual of racial announcement where everyone must tell you what their race is and you must engage with them at the level of their race. Um, you also see it in the idea of cultural appropriation, one of the key and craziest parts of political correctness, which is this idea that um, you can't really borrow from other cultures. So if you're a sh white student who wears a sombrero, that's offensive to Mexicans. If you are um, Katy Perry and you wear your hair in cornrows, that's offensive to black women and you're stealing black women's power. That's one of the headlines that was written about Katy Perry. And what the idea of cultural appropriation does, it, it rehabilitates the idea of racial purity. The idea that you should stick to your own race, you should stay in your own lane, you should do your own thing and not, e not even attempt to understand other cultures or other groups. And the PC are obsessed with making us racially aware. You're supposed to be racially aware all the time. And I think we sometimes fail to appreciate what a, um, how that destroys what was seen as the right way of engaging with the world in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, which was to refuse to be racially aware, to not be racially aware, to switch off your racial awareness that sometimes just kind of would creep up on you and instead judge people as individuals. So political correctness actually rehabilitates the racial imagination and that's one of the ways I think in which it unwinds some of the social gains of the past 50 years. Then in, rela in relation to women, I think one of the worst things, one of the reasons I'm opposed mostly to the new feminism is not actually because I think it's a war on men and boys. I know lots of people, very respectable people, have that point of view. 
and that's fine. My concern with it is actually that I think it demeans the idea of female autonomy. Because if you go around arguing, as many new feminists do, that we need censorship of lads' mags and we need censorship of certain pop songs and we need to control sexual male behaviour and everything from asking a woman if she wants a drink to putting your arm around her shoulder gets redefined as a form of sexual harassment. What that actually does, it communicates the message that women are fragile and are not as capable of negotiating public life as men are. And that represents, in my mind, uh, an unwinding, an undoing of one of the key social gains of recent times, which is that women are just as capable, and <laughs> in some cases probably better, than men at dealing with work life and public life. If you look at the trans movement, the transgender movement, which I won't go into too much detail on because I think it's uh, very strange in my view, but I think one of the achievements of the transgender movement is to rehabilitate misogyny. Because the idea that womanhood is such a flimsy thing, such a performance, such a, a, a garment, in essence, that a man can assume it simply with a click of his fingers, so that the Gender Recognition Act in the United Kingdom will allow you to change your gender without making any effort. So I could go into work with a beard tomorrow and say, call me Susan, and then the, my workplace has to do that. That will be the law. I think that is misogynistic. I think it demeans the idea of womanhood and undermines its biological, cultural, relational substance. So I think there's a misogynistic element to that, and that also represents an unwinding of the past. So in these various different ways, we can see how actually what PC grates against most is not really um, the old white world of the past, when minority groups really didn't have much impact on public life, but actually what came after that, the revolution of equality, the revolution of freedom, the revolutions of liberation. It's those things, I think, that are most harmed by political correctness. And then what this logic does, what this logic of victim culture does, this kind of demeaning of minority groups, it then has a terrible impact on the institutions of society. So, for example, education, a very important institution. It's the key means through which one generation transmits the cultural knowledge to the next. That's now been completely interrupted by political correctness. So the politically correct educational establishment thinks it is wrong to teach that Western civilization is anything special. They think it's wrong to teach children too much dead white European male stuff. You know, that's really bad to continually treat them all this, uh, teach them all this stuff by white men. And it, all, and it wants to relativize education and give them things that are, is apparently more appropriate to their way of life, to come down to their level in this incredibly paternalistic way. And that's done in the name of not offending minority groups. Minority groups are apparently very easily offended, very weak and so on, as PC would have us believe, need to be protected from certain forms of education. Uh, another institution that I think has been rattled pretty severely by political correctness is marriage. Marriage is one of those social institutions that I think is incredibly important. It is the means through which children are raised and socialized and the community itself is expanded and, and kept coherent. Marriage has now been redefined. I'm not going to dwell on this because I spectacularly lost, lost the argument on same-sex marriage and my liberal secular critique of it. But I do think that represents another institution which has been undone and again undone in the name of offering validation to, apparent, to an apparently fragile minority group. Um, and at the v most basic level, the most basic level of the sex divide, the gender divide, which is the means through which young people in particular make sense of the world, even that is now being erased. And we all now are supposed to bow before the cult of gender fluidity. And particularly in schools, in Britain, this is a very pronounced problem, in schools, teachers now s don't say boys and girls anymore for fear of offending the 0.01% of pupils who are gender confused. Um, uh, and I think even there you have this unravelling of one of the core institutions of society, which is the idea that there is a, a sex divide and, and that they are complementary and that that is an important part of human society. I think it's really <coughs> shocking that in the UK and Ireland as well and other countries are look likely to be following suit, you can now change your gender on your birth certificate. Now, the reason I have a real problem with that is because 
when a child is born, when a child was born in, in August 1985 and the doctors and the birth registrar wrote down that a boy was born, they were telling the truth. That was true. They were recording a public fact, a historical fact, a, a necessary fact for society to know who's in its society, who's being born and, and who, is, who are the citizens. You can now go back in time and replace that truth with a lie. You can say that on the, in August 1985, a girl was born, and it's not true. So I think a society that cannot even measure its citizenry, it cannot even keep a, a log of who is being born, where they're being born, who they are, and so on, is really spectacularly a society that has lost its moral anchor and any sense of how to organize itself. So what's important about political correctness, I think, is that it attacks both progressive gains, the liberation of minority groups from oppression, the liberation of women from second-class citizenship, and then through attacking those progressive gains, it also undermines the traditional institutions of society. So it's this double whammy effect of undermining racial and gender equality in a quite insidious way, and then as a knock-on effect of that, undermining some s important traditional institutions like education, marriage, um, the understanding of sex differences, and so on and so forth. Finally, I've run out of time, but I just want to throw out a couple of quick concerns with some of the pushback against PC. So I've established that I'm not a fan of political correctness. I think it has a very bad impact on society. But I do think we have to think carefully about how we revolt against it, which I think we should. Um, but I think some of the revolts currently taking place are problematic. I think the Trumpian revolt against PC is incredibly unhelpful. It's very uncouth. It's um, not particularly intelligent. I think it's quite knee-jerk. And it often in adopts uh, a mirror image of some of the problems with political correctness. For example, it replaces um, black victim culture or female victim culture with white male victim culture. And that's uh, been a key part, in fact, of Trump's success, is tapping into a sense of white victimhood. So it kind of is a mirror image, in many ways, of political correctness. I think the alt-right rebellion against political correctness is, is now just actually boring. Uh, uh, it's just, I think it's running out of steam, which is a relief. But I think that kind of um, knowingly provocative where you go on campuses and just scream in a feminist's face and hope that it goes viral on YouTube. But those kind of things are just unhelpful, and, and it's all heat and no light. And what it does is just maintains the political correctness problem as a performance, uh, so that both sides end up in this kind of symbiotic relationship, where the PC people need the alt-right loudmouths in order to prove that they do live in an oppressive patriarchal society, <laughs> and then the alt-right loudmouths need the PC to prove that pinkos have taken over the institutions and we're all going to hell in a handcart. So there's a, there is a marriage of convenience between those two things and no light is ever shed on the serious problems. Um, so I think we have to th think seriously about the impact that political correctness is having on society. I think it is tyranny by stealth, which is to borrow a phrase that Bill Leake used in his submission to the Human Rights Commission when they were persecuting him for the speech crime of drawing a cartoon. Um, so we do have to think about the tyrannical I impact it can have and the way in which it, in which it damages both social, socially progressive moves forward and also traditional institutions and ideals. But we have to do so in such a way that we enlighten people about the problems in society and tackle them in an intellectual, thoughtful way, because I think that's the only way to go forward in terms of making society less PC and more free. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. That was great. Th Brendan, thank you. And now it's time for the conversation part of today's event. And I call on my colleague and friend, uh, Jeremy Samet. Jeremy is the head of our Culture, Prosperity and Civil Society program. Over to you, Jeremy. Thanks, <coughs> Thanks Tom. And thank you, Brendan. Uh, we're always, we always welcome um, sound Marxists from Britain <laughs> and the CIS. However, if there are any unreconstructed socialists from Scotland, you know what you can do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I want to pick up the idea that PC is addressing these um, deep historical injustices. And you talk about it in the first chapter of your book, which is about uh, cultural <coughs> appropriation. The idea here is that you know, we are addressing these you know, deep-seated historical adjust injustices and oppression. But the point you make there is that there's actually a very nasty snobbishness about mm. PC, which is that if 
to use a term, the white woke class is actually signalling their moral and social superiority to people who they see as ordinary people who are indecent, are oppressive, are prejudiced. Absolutely. I think one of the... Uh one of the most fascinating things at the moment is white self-flagellation. So there's this, you know, because whiteness is now has been redefined as an original sin, the original sin of whiteness. If you're born white, you're a bad person. There's nothing you can do about it. That's one of the ideas that's pushed by political correctness. You know, the problem of white men in particular. I'm always amazed by how many articles and tweets and everything else you can read which are just attacking white men. And I've always thought it would be a really good social experiment for someone just to set up a website which repeated all these headlines but replaced white men with black men and I just think that would give a really interesting insight into that kind of discussion. But, w but a lot of that stuff, what's interesting is a lot of that stuff comes from white people. You have a white people all the time who go on about the problem of white people. Um, and, uh, and there's this kind of, and the argument I make is that that kind of self-flagellation, that kind of white self-loathing is actually a form of white pride. Because what they are saying is that we are woke white people, we are racially aware, we are socially aware, we are good, we know how horrible our history was, we know how awful uh, colonialism was, we know how privileged we are, we know that our privilege is built on the backs of slaves, all this kind of nonsense that they come out with. W they're really making a performance of their moral superiority to other white people, you know, the uneducated ones, the ones who aren't sufficiently racially aware. So the argument I make in, in that piece in the book is that um, it's like, I it's a new form of white nationalism. This is the great irony of this kind of new fashion for being politically correct and, and hating yourself because you're white. It ends up as a form of white nationalism. I, you know, I'm a good white person in comparison with the underclass bad white people. So yeah, there's a horrible racial element to all of that. The other side of the PC divisiveness that you were talking about in your speech is this idea that we are actually winding back the great liberal gains mm. that we've made and progressive gains that we've made on issues like race and, and gender. There was a story in the Wall Street Journal, uh, which you may have noticed the other day, which talked about how the consequence of the Me Too movement on Wall Street, in particularly in investment banks, there is now a sort of self-segregating process going yeah. on where men uh, won't go out to dinner with female colleagues, they won't mentor, they won't even take meetings alone with women. Uh, this is a, I think this is a broader phenomenon as well because one of the things that you hear in this era of you know, high PC, offence taking, sensitivity, that people won't mix not only across gender lines in the workplace but along racial yeah. lines as well. So in the name of preventing division, we're actually creating division. Absolutely. I th I, that Me Too story I thought was a perfect example of the kind of thing I'm talking about which is that um, what PC has done is completely screwed up the relations between the sexes. It's pr completely screwed up the Martin Luther King idea that you should judge people by their character rather than their color. And in fact, on some American campuses, including the University of California, they have a list of racial microaggressions. A microaggression is the kind of uh, conversational thing you say, which is uh, unwittingly racist. You know, if you ask someone, where are you from? Apparently that's really racist. <laughs> um, so uh, d they have this list of um, microaggressions. And, one of th and some of them are things like, I don't see race or I only see the human race, mm -hmm. or I prefer to judge people by how they present themselves rather than their racial background. Uh, exactly the things Martin Luther King said. So Martin Luther King these days were probably hounded off campus. Um, so, uh, and, and the reason they give for those things being racial microaggressions is because they deny um, people's racial experiences, or they deny people's, um, there's even one phrase, they deny their experiences as, as um, uh, as uh, uh, their racial history and their racial <coughs> um, display and all this kind of stuff. A and the point I was making earlier is that in the past, ignoring all that stuff would have been seen as the good progressive thing to do. You know, engaging with someone, not uh, uh, y if you meet someone, you don't think, oh God, what color are you? Where might you come from? Um, what terrible history did your ancestors suffer? You know, in the past, uh, not doing that and refusing to do that was seen as the progressive thing. And now the progressive thing is to constantly obsess over what color people are and then how you should engage with them because they're a different color from you. So I think uh, the Me Too stuff and the way in which that has segregated men and women or and threatens to do that even more, and the way in which the rehabilitation of racial thinking and racial policing, I think those two things are absolutely devastating to mm. some of the good stuff of the 19, there was some good stuff of the 1960s, and uh, those, those good things are being undone by all this. 
So if the social ramifications are important, what about how we push back against it? And to start with that issue, there is a school of thought, particularly among some people here in Australia and the centre right, which is that these culture war issues don't matter. They argue that economics is far more important, we should focus on that. Uh, I think they don't understand what the ideological agendas around uh, PC is, that controlling language means ultimately controlling thought, and there is a much bigger ideological agenda going on here. I completely agree. I think they are incredibly important issues. Um, you know, it's a point all well made all the time that the, the control of language is always about controlling how you think and ultimately how you behave. And I do think we are living through a period of uh, an attempted social re-engineering of society. You know, when when something like, if you say there are only two genders, if you said that on a campus in Britain now, you'd be in trouble. It is possible you would not be invited to speak, it's possible you'd be chased off campus. That was a perfectly normal thing for everyone to say about five or six years ago. So the speed with which this is happening, the Maoist speed with which things just become unsayable in a very short period of time, <laughs> it should always get people's alarm bells mm -hmm. ringing. Um, I did a talk about heresy at the University of Oxford, um, the importance of heresy in relation to progress and how heresy fuels progress, historically speaking. And I said, my heresy is that I don't think a man can become a woman. And the meltdown was just extraordinary. Uh, it was like, it reminded me when I was growing up a Catholic, when if you said you don't believe that the bread actually becomes the body of Christ. <laughs> that was like, wha what, you don't believe in transubstantiation? Get out of here. It's now, uh, we have a secular version of that now, uh, and the same kind of hounding of anyone who doubts it. So um, I think they're incredibly important issues. I do think that it, it can look crazy. You know, if you, if you find yourself, like I often do, writing a number of articles about the ins and outs of the transgender discussion, you do think, how did I end up here? Mm. Why is this happening to me? <laughs> but um, I think through all these issues, a lot of very important things are being changed and altered in a way that we might soon lose control of. And I think we've got to keep a handle on that or else we will lose the good stuff of society. Firstly, equality. And secondly, those key institutions through which we transmit knowledge and information and socialization to the next generation. Uh, Hannah Arendt made the point that the key responsibility of, of adult society is to transmit the cultural knowledge of the past to the next generation. And she said, when you don't do that, a break occurs. Mm. And it's a break <coughs> that could be quite difficult to fix. I think we are now in that break. Two issues about that in terms of pushing back. One is that one of the hard things in terms of pushing back is that so many of our institutions have adopted PC. Yeah. So it's universities, schools, corporates to a large extent as well. And if you actually go against PC within those organisations, they can have you know, serious professional social ramifications. That's, that's one issue. Mm. Second thing is that people, on the other hand, often say, well, isn't PC around issues like transgender being just being polite and you know, respecting the rights and identities of different people? Uh, however, I think, and do you agree, that in a sense the gender stuff is a tipping point. If in the name of PC we have to accept the absurd proposition that there's no such thing as a boy or a girl. Do you think that is something that will change, engage more people? Is there still a silent majority out there interested in oh these yeah. issues? Oh yeah, I think there is a silent majority. I think that's actually one of the most exciting things about the period we currently find ourselves in, which is that people are in open revolt <laughs> against the establishment. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I can't remember anything like this in my lifetime. There are currently um, massive street riots in France against climate change policy. That's unprecedented. That's never happened before. These are uh, hundreds of thousands of people in an uprising they haven't seen since 1968, and I think it could actually be bigger than 1968, who are raging against um, an environmentally friendly fuel tax. Um, and um, as a consequence of that, they're raising questions about the way in which governments mistreat drivers and people who have to use vehicles and all this kind of stuff. That's incredibly important. I think the Brexit revolt is obviously my favorite thing in modern times. Uh, I think it is um, incredibly important um, and I think it does represent a rejection of the technocratic, bureaucratic, politically correct elites who currently run Europe. Um, very obviously uh, is a rejection of those people. So that's incredibly important. I think even the vote for Trump, even though I am not a fan of Trump and I have a problem with the Trumpian approach to political correctness, even the vote for Trump I think speaks to that kind of desire to reject 
the politically correct establishment. Robbie Suave at Reason magazine um, makes a very, I think he's writing a book on it, makes a very good argument that the vote for Trump was in many ways a reaction against political correctness. So a lot of stuff is happening. A lot of very positive stuff is happening. Um, and so I do think there is a silent majority. I do think there are people out there who think there are two genders, that blasphemous thought, you know, it's not supposed <laughs> to have, who do think that marriage s plays a special role in society, um, who do think that, uh, you know, men chatting up women is not sexual harassment. There are, there's, a, there's a whole world of common sense out there, but it's not reflected in media and public discussion because that tends to be dominated by precisely the kind of people we're worrying about. So we, we are witnessing the capitulation of institutions to political correctness, but at the same time, I think a growing resentment among the public with a politically correct establishment. So that's the key tension of our times, which I think could be a very fruitful tension. Can I pick up the, uh, uh, that issue in terms of you know, where a lot of this stuff has come from, um, and uh, particularly in relation to the issue of same-sex marriage? Um, I think it once could have been said that th the gay liberation movement, you know, the, in a sense, gay people were the last of the bohemians, and it sounds increasingly that they are almost first among squares. <laughs> and it's this notion that the state is somehow responsible for people's dignity and their validation. And it's like, it, rather than the nanny state protecting us from harms that we inflict on ourselves, it's almost like we live in a daddy state where people constantly <laughs> yeah. seek val validation and approval of all these things. A at the price of, trans of ultimately transgressing on other people's yeah. rights and freedoms. I, I completely agree. I think this is you know, people will often say, people will often compare the transgender movement to the gay liberation movement. And I think they are completely opposite. I really think there's no compar no serious comparison can be made between these two things because the gay liberation movement of the 60s, well, all the liberation movements, the women liberation movement, the gay liberation movement, national liberation movements, which obviously lots of Western progressives supported, were about rejecting certain forms of authority and, rec and demanding greater autonomy and choice. They were liberal movements. Um, what you have now are identitarian, supposedly left-wing identitarian movements that are actually about seeking validation rather than autonomy and approval, particularly from the state, rather than the right to determine your own destiny as you see fit, regardless of whether the state agrees with you or not. So the transgender movement is the perfect example of that. Um, it's entirely opposite to the gay liberation movement. The gay liberation movement argued against the medicalization of homosexuality. The transgender movement argues for the medicalization of transgenderism. The gay li liberation movement argued for um, the state to get out of their lives by dismantling laws in particular which um, criminalized gay sex. Um, the transgender movement wants the state in their lives all the time in terms of more and more acts of law to offer recognition and validation and, and certificates and all this kind of stuff. So it's not a liberation movement at all. Mm. It's uh, actually, it ties people into a kind of relationship almost of psychic enslavement with the establishment where they become incredibly reliant upon the establishment's approval for their sense of self. I think that's incredibly destructive and I don't think that just goes for the transgender movement. I think across the board the identitarian movement which is uh, uh, you know in relation to all sorts of community minority politics now is largely about winning the backing of the state and winning resources from the state and in <coughs> order to do that you often have to advertise your weakness rather than advertise mm -hmm. your autonomy. So you have to advertise your wounds. Look how pathetic we are. Look how much we suffer from hate speech. Um, look how difficult our lives are. Please help us. So you're incited all the time to um, make a spectacle of your weakness, mm -hmm. whereas the older movements, I think, were invited people to make a spectacle of their strength, and that's a really important difference. Picking that up, we haven't used, the, I don't think we've used the word yet, but all this is obviously in a background of identity politics. And where I think it comes from is that, and the problem with identity politics is that it doesn't necessarily lie about the past. Of course, in the past, gay people, people of colour were you know, oppressed and uh, denied their rights. But so much of this is taught in the universities that you know, people hear that you know, our, hist our histories of our societies are just full of racism and those racism or, or prejudice continue to this day. It's almost as if people, in order to, their, their, their identities are so politicised that they have to sort of almost find a way mm. in contemporary society to prove that they are the oppressed, the poor. So it's issues like uh, 
policing language, oversensitivity, and in these ways that fundamentally divide us rather than focus on commonalities. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, you know, I just get bored of people talking about the past. Uh, you know, there's this movement at Oxford University called Roads Must Fall, which is an attempt to take down a statue of Cecil Rhodes, who was a colonialist, um, and uh, all these students who are Rhodes mm. scholars, so these are incredibly privileged students from different parts of the world. Uh, they say that the statue uh, reminds them of the, it makes them feel the wounds of history and <laughs> makes them feel the pain. <laughs> the pain. These are some of the most comfortable, comfortably off, um, uh, happy <laughs> students in the world, or they should be, claiming about <laughs> feeling the pain of history. And what you realise is that you know everyone talks about cultural appropriation, but this is historical appropriation. Mm. They're, they're appropriating the pain of past generations because, and this is uh, the important thing, they're doing it because there's actually nothing in their lives that is particularly difficult. And that's a real problem for them <coughs> because today the great way in which you win social support and social validation is by being a victim. Mm -hmm. So if you've got nothing in your life that makes you a victim, you, you, are, you have to exaggerate stuff or you have to go looking in the past and borrow the suffering of your great, 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 great grandfather and say, oh, that's it, there. Um, so, and the point I made in, one of the, in a debate with one of these people is that it would be like me saying, you know, I can't bear to see an image of a potato because it would remi remind me of the potato famine and all my <laughs> relatives who all died. And they saw that was really offensive and outright, but it's the exact, <laughs> it's the exact same thing. It's the exact same thing. So this kind of... Um, trawling of history for some evidence of victimhood I find really obnoxious but it is all part of that um, constant incitement to play the victim card mm. and playing the victim card has a really devastating impact on you as an individual because it, it, you kind of d you disavow your own autonomy and say please help me I'm ridiculous and pathetic it has a de devastating impact on freedom of speech because it polices what everyone says lest you know mm. they offend someone and it has a devastating impact on those traditional institutions and I think that's the key thing it's through um, the cult of the victim that uh, not only the individual autonomy is undone and the gains of that but also these traditional institutions because the reason we can't have the standards or anything else that we had in the past is apparently because it's offensive to these victim groups. There was a, I was lucky enough to be at the Battle of Ideas uh, conference in London, which I rec highly recommend to everybody um, in October. Uh, <coughs> and there was a session on the whole roads must fall uh, <coughs> issue. And I asked a question and made the point that in Australia, we you can't have a public <coughs> gathering without, except at the CIS, without having a welcome to country. Mm. You can't... Um, we have given back lots of, the high court has decided that the traditional owners of the land are Aboriginal people. But at the same time, we now have this push to, uh, you know, change Australia Day. And one of the things I think is really <coughs> important when we talk about people dredging up historical, um, historical facts is that at some point, if we're going to have a society that reflects and respects everybody's right, is forgetting sometimes something we should encourage people to do and a get absolutely. on with it. Absolutely. I think yeah, I love Australia, but there's one thing I don't like about Australia. It's in a constant state of apologism, uh, even more than Britain. And Britain is pretty bad. Like Tony Blair apologised for the Irish famine, for example. You think, well, was that really your fault? I don't understand <laughs> how that's possible. Um, but Australia does that all. It just keeps saying sorry all the time. And there does come a point where you think, OK, guys, that's history. Let's move on. I can't remember. There was some American commentator who was involved in a debate on a campus, I uh, can't remember who it was, and um, this young black woman in the audience was standing up and talking about history and so on, and he said, look, this is the starting point of our discussion. You have never been a slave, and I have never been a slave owner. And that has got to be the starting point of the discussion. It doesn't matter, you can't visit the sins of the fathers upon the children, that's <laughs> medieval. So um, I do think there comes a point when you have to say, and by you I mean people like you, you have never stolen an Aboriginal child. You had nothing to do with that. Uh, and uh, that's the way it is. Um, so I do think there has to come a point where you think, OK, we have to let history lie. Because th this misuse of history for the purpose of demonising certain <coughs> um, majority groups in society 
as guilty of the crimes of history and also uh, accentuating the victimhood of minority groups is just really destructive. It's destructive of any serious attempt to understand what history was about and why there were problems and to treat it as an intellectual endeavor to know your history and to understand history. It's, it's destructive of that because it's all entirely politicized mm. and it's destructive of cultural and social relations now where you're constantly having to divide people up into the beneficiaries of history and the victims of history. So I think it's, it's very poisonous and we need to draw a line in the sand. The proponents of political correctness can never understand though why people push back against these issues bec and they don't understand that people, as you say, are being blamed for things that they were actually not responsible for. Don't believe not responsible for. However, the problem, and you allude to when you speak speech about a lot of the pushback is that sort of Trump, the Milos, the alt-rights, they um, have sort of given up on civility and a lot mm. of their pushback is you know, often bitchy and personal and as you say it plays into the hands of the, of the PC group because as they see here's the problem this is why we need PC. Uh, you're a free speech absolutist but I, it is, there's a difference isn't there between no idea should be unsayable but there are some things you shouldn't say. Um, yes, I think civility is a good thing. I'm slightly worried about um, however, having said that, I am slightly worried about the over-policing of incivility. And I think it is worth bearing in mind that um, in, the in the English context, for example, one of the great justifications for censorship in the past was to tackle incivility. So if you look back to the period of the 1640s and the 1650s when we had a revolution and a civil war and everything else, all the pamphlets that were produced by the Cromwellians and the Levellers and all these parliamentarians who wanted to behead the king and do all this kind of radical stuff. Um, all their pamphlets were completely uncivil. They were libelous, they were defamatory, they made accusa accusations against bishops and kings that were completely and utterly untrue because that was the means through which they stirred up the people and stirred them up to take action and so on. Um, and then laws were passed against um, uh, incivility and then that had a very devastating impact on political discourse itself. So uh, I do think we have to tread a fine line. I do think we are in a period right now, I think one of the reasons we have incivility is because people are struggling to find a political language through which to express their opposition to the establishment. So it does take on that 1640s style, you know, just screaming at a politician and saying you're a bitch or whatever it might be in this kind of infantile way because people are struggling for the context and the language and the, and the meaning through which they might express their opposition. So I understand where incivility comes from, but I think you're absolutely right in relation to the alt-right people. Um, I'm, I'm glad that ship has sailed because I just think that was incredibly unhelpful. Um, that kind of knowingly uncivil mm. discourse where you'd go on and, and say knowingly provocative things and then the audience would start crying and everyone would start laughing. I mean, you know, it was fun for three years, but let's move on now. So I'm glad that's gone. Uh, but I do think um, the best way to challenge political correctness is not to rise to the bait. So people will call you a fascist and a transphobe <coughs> and an Islamophobe and all this stuff. And it is important not to rise <laughs> to that and instead just to keep pushing the argument for freedom and equality and all those things that we think are being undermined by the tyranny by stealth of political correctness. Final question before we throw it open to the audience. Uh, sometimes, however, even if you do win the battle against political correctness or the political class or the elites, uh, they still remain in control of <coughs> the, the game in a sense. And I guess that's really the lesson of Brexit. Brexit, for particularly for people in Australia, was this great moment of hope and triumph, the sort of belief that you could push on these political, cultural, social issues over a long, time, long term and, and finally have success. But that uh, victory appears mm. to have been squandered. Yes, Brexit is in a very precarious position right now. It's actually really quite scary. Um, so Theresa May's withdrawal agreement is literally the opposite of Brexit because it keeps us in certain EU institutions, particularly the customs union arrangements and certain single market arrangements. But it deprives us of the right unilaterally to leave those new arrangements without the say-so of the European Court of Justice. So it literally makes Britain into a vassal state. I mean, it's far more shocking even than I anticipated it to be. Um, so actually, we're in a if it goes through, which I think is unlikely, they're voting on it next week, 
uh, we would be in a worse position than we were when we were in the European Union, which is the thing 17.4 million people voted against. Um, so it's in a very precarious position, which I think is bad for the whole world, <laughs> because I do think Brexit has become something of a beacon to lots of people who would like to shake off the shackles of bureaucracy and technocracy and paternalism and um, restrictions on free trade and all these other things that the EU is really the archetype of, that kind of new political establishment. Um, because, um, you know, the political establishment, they're right to be scared of Brexit because it is, I think, the most open challenge to their moral and political authority of the past 40 years or so. Um, and I think if they manage to do over Brexit or destroy Brexit or dilute it so much that it's just remained by another name, I do think serious in all seriousness that that will set back the cause of arguing for greater freedom and greater choice by a long margin. So I think everyone across the world who's interested in those issues has a vested interest in helping make sure that Brexit happens. It, ha it has to happen. Thanks, Brendan. Thank you, Jeremy. Now it's time for Q&A, and our first question comes from <coughs> uh, Claire Lehman. Claire is the editor of Quillette magazine, a very popular online magazine, and she's addressed CIS on three occasions this year. Claire. Thanks, Tom. Hi, Brendan. Hi. Thanks for your talk. It was fascinating. I'm wondering um, how optimistic or pessimistic you are about the future, and um, the way I'm thinking of it is We've gone through periods of mass hysteria before and there was even an outbreak of political correctness back in the 90s, the early 90s, and then people like Camille Parlier came along and sort of shook things up and things got back to normal. Are we going through another phase of mass hysteria or is this something more sinister and larger and is it uh, something that reflects a, a a break or a bigger shift in Western culture? Um, I'm actually very optimistic right now, largely because, well, largely because of Brexit, but also because of other things that are happening. I'm very excited about what's happening in France. I know it's quite violent and it's kind of can turn s some certain people off, but I do think that's a very interesting, those are very interesting events too. So I'm pretty optimistic in terms of these kind of slightly unprecedented revolts that have taken place, whether through the ballot box or on the streets. Um, so that makes me optimistic. But I think at the same time, political correctness is becoming more and more entrenched, particularly in certain institutions. I think the interesting thing about the 90s, I've been, I was talking to some of the people involved in the pushback against 1990s political correctness, like um, Wendy Kaminer in the US and also Nadine Strossen, who was president of the American Civil Liberties Union in the 90s. And they did a very good job of pushing back against not only politically correct censorship, but also against the introduction of sexual harassment into workplaces, sexual har harassment codes rather, and their argument that that was a way of policing sexual relations. So they did a very good job of pushing back against that. And they're really shocked to see that all this stuff has come back. But I think the reason is that um, they may have won some battles in the 1990s, but they lost the war. And some of them didn't quite notice that they had lost mm. the war. They didn't notice that this stuff was gathering pace. I always think it's incredibly important to remember that political correctness really takes hold I think, in the 1980s, which is the period in which Thatcher and Reagan were running the world. So it seems counterintuitive, but what I think it demonstrates is that that undercurrent, that new political establishment creeping in and not necessarily in a democratic way, has been going on for a long time and has been gathering pace. So I think it's a pretty strong ideological movement. Um, I do think we it represents a break I think, uh, but I'm talking about the last 40 years or so, represents a break from what went before that. And I do think we have our work cut out for us in challenging it because I think it is more substantial and more deep-rooted than some of those 90s activists might have realised. But the optimism uh, I have is down to the fact that I do think there's a silent majority and I do think they're not willing to remain silent much longer. And I think that's where we can really see some hope for change. I think, although the problem is that I think you're right. If something is politically unsustainable, it should be politically unsustainable and things should change. But my fear about the political class is, is, is it because the weapons that PC uses are so personal and you are not just seen as having a different political opinion, you are seen as a bad person yeah. with a whole range. <coughs> it, it makes it harder for the system to correct. 
That's my fear. And so the political class will hang on, will alienate people who dissent from, from what they see as the orthodoxies. Yeah. And the system can't, in a sense, generate, regenerate it in the way it should. Uh, I think that's true. I think um, it's very difficult to raise criticisms of this stuff because you will be shot down as a fascist or alt-right or transphobic, or all these phobias that they've invented um, th to, to kind of demonize criticism of their ideological view of the world. Um, but it might take a long time. I was in Mexico City a couple of weeks ago and they have this great museum of the Inquisition. The Inquisition was very strong in Mexico as well as in Europe. and. Um, it's this really tacky museum with all these kind of dummies being tortured and blood gushing out. <laughs> but <laughs> it's also really right. uh, it's also really interesting and historically substantial. And it makes some points that really um, made me feel alarmed. The first is that one of the key things about the Inquisition was the presumption of guilt. That was absolutely essential to the Inquisition. Everyone was presumed to be guilty as soon as they were um, uh, grasped up uh, to, to the authorities. Um, and the other one was, of course, as we all know, the restriction on certain books and the Vatican that eventually drew up a list of banned books and, and banned ideas and all this stuff. And you do, uh, you do see echoes of that today in the attacks on due process and particularly in the Me Too movement, for example, which presumes guilt. People's lives have been destroyed on the basis of accusation alone, which is entirely unjust. Mm -hmm. And also <coughs> in the way in which certain ideas and books and, and, and ways of thinking are shunned from academic life and public life. So, a, and the thing to bear in mind, this, uh, this museum makes very clear, is that the Inquisition was, um, the Inquisition was considered for a long period of time to be a normal way of organizing society mm -hmm. uh, by a substantial number of people. And I think that's currently what we have now. Yeah, next question, Monica, w Monica Wilkie, who wrote a lead piece in the Sydney Daily Telegraph on our immigration polls that showed increasing support for cutting immigration. Monica. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Brendan, you mentioned briefly your experience at Oxford University, and I know that Spiked has done a lot of work about free speech, particularly on campuses. You wrote a piece recently where you said that students should still be allowed to ban speakers. And I just wondered if you could talk through sort of the rights of free speech and then people still being allowed to ban, students being allowed to ban speakers. Did I say that? <laughs> that possibly there, there was a piece, there was a piece on Spike, <laughs> the, po sorry, possibly wasn't, there was a piece on Spike recently where it said that students should be allowed to ban speakers if they want to. Oh, uh, okay, I think, I, yeah, I think I know what you're referring to. That I didn't write that piece. Apologies that, for that. Yeah, sorry, that's fine. I together. don't think students Thanks. should ban speakers, but the, the, I think I know what you mean. In, in Britain, the government is currently trying to restrict censorship on campus, and it's doing that by proposing new codes of conduct and new legally enforceable codes of conduct which would prevent students from banning speakers. And I have a problem with that too, because that is uh, government interference into student society. So I think that's what the person was writing about. But my view of what's happening on campuses in the UK and increasingly in Australia is that it really does speak to all the sorts of problems we're talking about, which is this sometimes visceral intolerance <coughs> of um, certain points of view or certain ways of thinking. <coughs> uh, every time I speak at Oxford or Cambridge, there's a protest. Uh, the last time I spoke at Oxford, uh, so, uh, a young woman started to hyperventilate. I mean, <laughs> really, she she Perhaps literally. That was for other well, <laughs> <laughs> she um, she she literally had to be helped from the room uh, after I made some comments <laughs> on rape culture. So, so so that's where I think Claire's point about hysteria. I think that there, there are sometimes it, there is a s flashes of Salem like hysteria, the way in which people kind of melt in front of words or ideas they disagree with. And I think that's because, uh, and I made this point at a conference that Claire and I both spoke at in Sweden earlier this year, that's because um, w society no longer gives young people the raw materials of adulthood. We don't socialize them in, in such a way that they become capable of negotiating conflict and tension. So one of the point, one of the things I think is most problematic is anti-bullying initiatives in schools. Now that doesn't mean I'm mm. pro-bullying, mm. but the ever-expanding okay. meaning of the word bullying and yeah. the way in which children are protected from any sort of rough and tumble or conflict or even fight, <coughs> uh, 
in addition to helicopter parenting and kids not being allowed to play out and all that kind of stuff, I think does have a very serious impact on their ability to develop autonomy. Mm -hmm. And that's now playing out on campus. You know, these days kids aren't allowed out. When I was young, we weren't allowed in. We were <laughs> never, <laughs> you know, in the summer holidays, <laughs> um, my mum would kick me and my five brothers out of the house and we were absolutely forbidden from coming back because <laughs> she had work to do. She couldn't have us around the house. So that generational shift, I think, yeah has a really devastating impact on how young people then become adults or don't become adults. Let's move right along because we've got a lot of questions to get through. Next question, James Phillips. Thanks, Tom. The, um, you, you mentioned uh, the institution of marriage. Um, in the US, I think I'm right in saying that the um, proportion of kids who grow up in um, households with uh, two parents uh, is highest towards the upper end of the socioeconomic spectrum and, and lowest towards the bottom end. And a lot of the people at the upper end um, preach, uh, sorry, preach that um, you know any form of uh, household is okay, um, and uh, let's say a liberal attitude to marriage or non-marriage. Yet they don't live by that uh, uh, that creed. And the people who suffer most from the breakdown of marriage are the kids who are growing up in the um, single parent households. That's a, not a statement of opinion. It's a, it's um, if you look at their performance, they. Um, on lots of indicators, um, it's not a good thing for them. Um, do you see a lot of this sort of hypocrisy and double standard in some of the issues around <coughs> the political, politically correct movement? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Christopher Lash makes this point in his book, Culture of Narcissism, published in 1979, which I still think is, is the best guide to the world that we currently so live the in. The revolt of the elites and betrayal uh, of the masses? Yeah, that, ca that came after. It came cul after it, Culture yeah. of Narcissism uh, yeah. was published in 79, and it's absolutely brilliant book. And one of the things he talks about is the corrosion of marriage as an institution and the way in <coughs> which the political and cultural elites then try to present that as a potentially positive thing. So they talk about choice and single parents being just as good as two parents, which everyone knows is not true because apart from anything else, it creates more work for the single parent and children miss out on the balance that is offered mm. be by um, opposite sex relationships and marriages and so on. So yes, I do think there's a strong element where um, the political elites say one thing and do another. But I, d I think they underestimate the seriousness of corroding adult authority in particular. And the adult authority is often expressed through the role of parenting. So if you look at London, for example, I know that lots of people in Australia have been reading about our crime epidemic, where there have been mass, mass amounts of stabbings, mass amounts of even acid attacks. And s parts of London are literally out of control. There mm -hmm. are parts of London now that I do not go to. And I think that is a function of years and years and years of corroding the authority of parents, corroding the sovereignty of the family, corroding the, uh, the ability to discipline children in, sco <coughs> in schools, all those things have a knock-on effect. And what you end up doing is churning out a new generation who have never been disciplined in any serious way. Uh, and then as a consequence, they become slightly out of control. So we are starting to reap what we sow in relation to the undermining of those core community and family institutions mm -hmm. through which children used to be socialised. Next question, Ray Hood. Thanks, Brendan. Um, I just want to make a point. I, when I was coming and told a friend I was coming to this talk, they said, oh, I didn't realise you were so conservative. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not conservative, you know. And if anything, I would argue that the forces of reaction are coming from the left. Mm -hmm far more these days. And you mentioned it the other night with Andrew Bolt, uh, the question of what is left and what is right now really, um, where uh, you know, you've know you got far more forces coming of, of reaction from the left. And also you mentioned that Andrew Bolt introduced you as a Marxist libertarian, if you could just <laughs> speak to that. Uh, and just, yeah, I mean, just those points. I mean, what is really this really? Yeah, yeah. Marxist libertarian, is yeah. that an oxymoron? <laughs> uh, everyone tells me it is. I, I don't think it is. Um, but, uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's true. The conservative thing really actually gets on my nerves because uh, on Q&A the other night, they, they announced at the end that I'm on, on Monday and they said, Brendan O'Neill, editor of the conservative magazine Spite, oh, which is it's it's just, it's just yeah. really straight. I mean, yeah. Spite wants to abolish the it's monarchy. A uh, yeah, it's a health <laughs> warning. We want to it's abolish the <coughs> monarchy, abolish the House of Lords, abolish the European Union. We're pro-freedom of speech. We're pro-choice. We, these are not really conservative. We don't want to conserve society in that sense. Um, so that's very strange. But I do think Marxist-libertarian, um, 
sometimes I say that just to wind people up because <laughs> it really gets on their nerves. But the I was asked about this last night. I did a uh, talk for the Menzies Research Centre in, in a pub in King's Cross last night. Uh, very classy event it was. <laughs> um, and um, people asked me about that. And I always quote Trotsky. I always quote my favourite ever line written by any political person, which is from Trotsky. And he said, the role of a progressive is to... Um, increase the power of man over nature and decrease the power of man over man. And that is how I view the world. Now, whether that makes me a Trotskyist or not, I don't know. <laughs> but I would, that's how I would sum up my view of the world. We need to increase the power of man over nature in terms of more development and progress and industrialization and growth. And we need to decrease the power of man over man in terms of getting rid of censorship and social control mm. and authoritarianism. So, am I a Trotskyist? I don't know. But that's certainly the best ever description I've heard of what I think good progressive people should do. Jeremy, do, do labels foster simplistic divisions and create artificial alliances increasingly? I think they do. I think the terminology <laughs> in, uh, in, in dealing with these issues is important. Like I often fall into the left-right language, mm -hmm. but I actually think that the terms that we should use in, in relation to where all this stuff is coming from is either progressive left or postmodern left because it comes from an ideological agenda which they basically believe if you control language, there's no such thing as objective reality. So if you can control language, you can control society. And that's where, it, that's where it's coming from. Can I just say one quick yeah. thing on that? I think you know, one of the things I really dislike about the modern left or whatever it is, is the way they call everyone a fascist if they disagree with them. But then, mm. by the same token, one of the things I dislike about the modern right is the way they call everyone who disagrees with them a Marxist. Mm. So if you, want, if you think yeah. education yeah. Sh should be provided by the government, suddenly you're a Marxist. Yeah. Or... People talk about cultural Marxism. Now, I know some people in this room will use the term cultural Marxism and think it's an important term. It's my least favorite yeah. political phrase of modern times. And I think it's, it's an inaccurate uh, phrase for what we're currently yeah. living through. So I do think thinking, uh, and I fall back in, I, you know, I'm always slagging off lefties, but at the same time, I don't actually think they're properly left wing. So we all yeah. do it. But I do think it sometimes pays just to be a bit careful about the language. Because okay, we've got to move right along. Tim James. G'day, Brendan. Thanks very much. That was great. I just wanted to ask you, uh, in a sense, w what's next and where does this go? So it seems as though gender can be fluid and flexible, sexuality can be fluid and flexible. I noted that case in the Netherlands recently where that bloke who's 69 wanted to yeah. identify, or does identify as a 49-year-old and wanted to legally change his age. <laughs> I think the court declined him that yeah. opportunity. But, but what's next? I mean, wh wh where does this end, really? Well, that's the million dollar question. I think transracialism is probably the next step. At the moment, everyone always, people always laugh at, at transracialists, you know, white people who, who identify as black. And th there are some people who do that. But the point I always make is that, th to my mind, that actually makes more sense than transgenderism. I mean, it, you know, if, if I claim to be a black man, that would be absolutely ridiculous. But I have far more in common with a black man, biologically speaking, than I do with a woman. Um, so I've always <coughs> argued that if I were to identify as the opposite race, that would yeah. make more sense to me than if I were to identify as the opposite gender. So um, who knows where it's going to go? I do think, I, I do think there's going to come a breaking point. Um, uh, uh, well, we're already living through a breaking point, but on issues like gender fluidity and so on, I do think and hope there will be a breaking point among parents who will start saying, well, I don't necessarily want this 15-year-old boy in my girl's locker room at school, right? I don't want him there. He's probably a pervert of some description. So um, I do think that kind of pushback is already happening in, in some American schools, and I think that will gather pace, I hope, because otherwise the question of where it will end is anyone's guess. Final question. Uh, Kirsty O'Sullivan, who's come up all the way from Melbourne to be with us today. Kirsty. Thanks. Thanks, Brendan. Um, I just wanted to, well, two <coughs> points, sorry. Um, initially, just on the, talking about the discipline of children, um, it's so funny how they sort of, there's that aspect of it where they do sort of tend to go wild and go crazy and yet <coughs> at the other end they get disciplined at school for things like over enthusiastic high fives yeah. and that kind of thing. It, that always <coughs> seems really bizarre to me. But I'm just wondering if, uh, if you can think of a time or a moment where we've shifted from that, that stage of sort of promoting how, how strong or how good you might be to that sort of currency of the victimhood, if you can think of Anything that sort of changed that moment, wh why did we change? Um, that's a good question. I think the 1980s was key to this. The 1980s, certainly in the British context, is really when the left goes from talking about 
class to identity, um, from jobs and the economy and so on to um, issues of culture and attitude and stuff like that. So the 80s was very important. I think it probably relates to um, the left's increasing isolation, um, their loss of political authority uh, in that era, um, and their increasing sense of distance from ordinary people. So the more distant they became from ordinary people, the more they lost interest in <laughs> the issues of ordinary life, like how do you make ends meet and so on, and they become obsessed with these more eccentric, tr uh, uh, trendy gender issues. I think the 80s were important. I think the 1960s were important. I, th I have this strong attachment to the 1960s. I think a lot of it was very positive. But I do think some crap kind of sneaked through uh, and became uh, overly dominant. But I think in relation to all of this stuff, uh, the key argument I would make in relation to political correctness and uh, is, is constantly, co and this relates to a question you asked, Jeremy, you fight back by constantly confronting uh, uh, people who say that you can't say that. Um, be more assertive, <coughs> say the things you're not supposed to say, and do so from the perspective that a, f a society in which all ideas are out in the open and can be heard and discussed is always preferable to a society in which things are un unsaid or things are censored. And that's got to be the key argument going forward, that everything should be sayable in order that we can argue about it and talk about it. Ladies and gentlemen, CIS is blessed with many distinguished scholars, none more so than Stephen Schwartz, who happens to be uh, one of our nation's leading education experts, a sound classical liberal who just happens to have been, of all things, a leading vice chancellor at many of our universities, <laughs> Stephen Schwartz. Um, I can't hear my I can't hear it myself, but people tell me I speak with an accent, um, and if I do, there's an explanation. Uh, and that's because I grew up in the USA and uh, in the 60s that Brendan has just alluded to. And I grew up in a city in which about close to 40% of the people who lived there were black, Afro-American, uh, in today's terminology. And I didn't know any of them. I went to schools that didn't have any black people in them. I shopped in shops that didn't have any Afro-Americans in them, swam in a public swimming pool that didn't have any and we never interacted. And then, gradually, uh, this, the integration movement took place. A friend of mine was the first Afro-American, first black student at the University of Georgia, spent four years with no one speaking to her at the university. In order to achieve the goal of an integrated, colorblind society. And now we have the University of Queensland, I think, which everybody knows here, one of the universities in Queensland, uh, which runs a segregated computer lab. Uh, and when students complained about the segregated computer lab, they were dragged into the Australian Human Rights Commission and put through a harrowing uh, experience, which some of them won't recover from, uh, for the crime of saying they think there should be integration and not segregation. And somewhere up in heaven, Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela are weeping um, this is, uh, it's easy to poke fun at a lot of the zany political correct things that are going on, especially the microaggressions and the, all the other stupidity. But what Brendan has shown us today is that this is not funny. This is actually really serious. Um, and while I hope that Claire's right and that it all kind of goes away, maybe it has the seeds of its own. It's so stupid it probably contains the seeds of its own demise. Uh, but for today, I think Brendan has reminded us that in Orwell's expression, if liberty means anything at all, it means having the right to tell people what they don't want to hear. And for that, Brendan, we are very grateful to you. Please join me. Thank you.